Hello, my name is Helge from Divinity Foundation and today I'll talk about arbitrary timing amplification for side channel attacks. In this talk I'll present a new kind of spectra attack. Um, the significance of this is um, that it is applicable to scenarios where the well-known spectra attacks may not actually work. In the first part of this talk, I'll talk about uh, microarchitecture side channel attacks in general and do a brief review of the existing and well known spectra class attacks. I'll uh, talk a little bit about the WebAssembly execution and security model. And the second half of the talk uh, will turn to discussing the new class of spectra attack um, and explaining its practical feasibility as well as the engineering consequences that result from its existence. First, a few generalities. Microarchitecture side channel attacks extract information out of system by uh, making measurements against the microarchitecture state of the CPU. Typically, this is some form of cache access, and what it requires to make these measurements is uh, small time differences in execution of instructions. This is on the order of about 100 nanoseconds, not a lot, but clearly measurable. And they usually involve some kind of speculative uh, execution uh, that produces a data-dependent microarchitecture state. Since the microarchitecture state is shared between lowly sensitive and highly sensitive code running on the same CPU, uh, this can then be abused by some trickery to extract data out of the system. This risk in principle exists whenever some kind of foreign code is executed on the target system because by definition it must interact with the microarchitecture state. Uh, but it depends on the precise circumstances um, if the required measurement or state preparation is actually possible. The important thing to know about uh, microarchitecture side channel attacks is that there is no single defense against this. It always requires some cooperation between hardware, software and system design to thwart these attacks or render them harmless. Typically the attack mechanism itself cannot prevent it altogether, but what can be affected is uh, both the leak rate and what kind of data can be leaked um, using these mechanisms and it's often rendered harmless by making sure that only non-vital data can be leaked. One very intuitive approach is to interfere with the timing measurement. Since the timing measurement needs to be on the order of maybe 100 microseconds, it would seem intuitive that um, denying access to a high precision clock and just a clock that measures in the microsecond or millisecond range, such uh, time measurements would be impossible. However, it, as it turns out, this is not entirely true. Um, various research has shown that this can be defeated by, for example, recovering a high precision clock from a low precision clock or living on the clock edge and doing some thresholding measurements. So uh, interference with the timing measurement has limited effectiveness on uh, mitigating side channel attacks. To understand spectra attacks a little bit better, uh, let's have a look at RAM and cache organization of our uh, computer systems. From the cache perspective of the cache, uh, we can think of the RAM as organized in uh, distinct blocks where each block has a, a specific kind of color. The cache is far smaller uh, than the RAM and it is organized in a number of cache sets where uh, there is one cache set for each color. Each cache set in turn uh, contains a limited number of blocks. Um, in the example shown, this is precisely two blocks. It's called a two-way set associative cache. Typical realizations are more like eight-way associative. If a memory access comes in, then it can be very quickly determined which cache set it belongs to. It's basically the color of the corresponding memory cell. And by another very quick lookup, we can determine whether the memory address is presently held inside the cache. If on the other hand, a memory access to a memory cell um, comes in that is not presently held in cache, this can also be determined very quickly. However, the requisite data must then be fetched from RAM. The purpose of the cache is then of course uh, to take this data and uh, in, um, put it into the cache such that subsequent access to the same memory address are significantly faster the next time around. The way is this, this is utilized in spectra class attacks is that we'll allocate a probe array in RAM with a couple uh, of memory cells of um, suitably chosen colors. As a preparation to this attack, uh, we'll first clear this probe array from the cache, make sure that none of the memory cells are held in cache. 
The next stage involves triggering some kind of speculative execution. It is where a low privileged function of the system coaxes the processor to speculate uh, some execution on behalf of a more privileged security domain inside the system. And uh, this speculative access will use a secret value that is only accessible to the more privileged domain and perform a speculative access using the secret value as an index into our probe array. The effect of this speculation is that the corresponding memory block will actually be pulled into the cache. Then the less privileged code can perform a timed read against some of those memory cells and this way reveal what the secret uh, that is normally inaccessible to it uh, can actually be. So there is a distinct structure to this kind of uh, spectra attack. In the first stage, a microarchitecture state is prepared, in this case, clearing the cache. In the second stage, a speculative access uh, is used to produce a secret dependent microarchitectural state. And in the third stage, we perform a one-time measurement of this produced microarchitectural state. This is performed by measuring the speed up to access to certain memory locations. The importance here is uh, that we need a separable measurement of the third stage, because the first two stages are actually computationally expensive and doing a combined measurement might make uh, the whole signal um, pretty much inaccessible, uh, such that we cannot produce a useful measurement from this anymore. Let's now have a look at WebAssembly, its execution and security model. WebAssembly offers a 32-bit abstract virtual machine. It's a popular choice for allowing safe execution of foreign code on target systems. Looking at typical technical realizations on our 64-bit hosts, uh, it roughly looks like this. The logical linear 32-bit address space of the WebAssembly process is embedded into the larger 64-bit address space of the host process. The WebAssembly instructions are translated to native code. This is a very efficient translation, and this translation also ensures that the WebAssembly code can never perform out-of-bounds accesses relative to its own 32-bit address space. Any access to either the host process or uh, external entities uh, needs to be mediated to, through a system API that is provided by the host process and completely under control of the host process so it can perform any kind of access control checks. Conceptually, this model is sound. It guarantees the integrity of the host process irrespective of what the WebAssembly process is trying to do. However, um, there is peculiarity, namely to the CPU, this distinction between the WebAssembly process space and its host process, this doesn't exist to the CPU. It's a flat 64-bit address space and also the instructions uh, resulting from the WebAssembly translation and uh, the host code, they are indistinguishable. This means that the CPU actually has no reason to believe um, that uh, there is any distinction between the two and will happily speculate any uh, out-of-bounds successes, even if the WebAssembly code cannot really execute them. And this actually opens the door. Uh, it turns out that it's actually relatively easy from the WebAssembly code to trigger speculation into the host process code. Now, this is a commonly known problem, typical scenarios, uh, for example, web browsers or similar where foreign code um, is executed in a host process. Web browser cases, this is more JavaScript, but it could also be a web assembly. And this process typically has no problems triggering some kind of speculative execution in the host process. And there is also a clock API available. This means that the uh, web assembly process uh, would have all means available to mount side channel attacks to read the entire host process memory. This is all well known. They are very well uh, researched attacks. They are also well known mitigations. Um, this is done in everyday browser, where the host process is basically a non-privileged process that holds no secret, such that if the uh, embedded WebAssembly process wants to leak any data, it can in principle do so, but there is simply no secret that is worth leaking. Now. Let's turn to a scenario that is less well researched and it does not look too different, but there's actually a huge qualitative difference. And it is the scenario of uh, WebAssembly use in the internet computer. And there may also be other related projects that use WebAssembly in the same way. In this case, there's actually no clock API available to the uh, WebAssembly process. 
Um, that means the uh, code executed on target uh, inside the WebAssembly cannot time its own execution. Any timing measurements uh, that need to be taken can only be done by an external controller, which basically needs to trigger execution of the target system, for example, via a query call, then waiting for the response and uh, from the delay time, try to infer something about the execution time on the target system. The importance here is, uh, first of all, uh, that this measurement is, of course, heavily disturbed through all the network communication uh, that is going on uh, in this measurement. And secondly, uh, that there is no separable measurement of individual parts of the execution on the target. So we can basically only execute, uh, um, measure the whole execution, but not individual parts of it. This, of course, then uh, raises the question uh, what this means for spectral class attacks. It might be possible to conduct uh, traditional spectral class attacks by triggering two different executions, one performing the preparatory stages one and stages two of the uh, attack, and then perform a, a second execution on the target uh, that does the stage three of the spectral attack, which is the actual timing measurement to leak the microarchitectural state. This is, however, still very difficult to conduct because um, it is not guaranteed that the state is actually preserved across these. It is also a question whether a combined measurement yields some signal, so we are not fully certain whether the known spectral class attacks would work in this scenario. The larger question then, of course, is whether the system is altogether immune to such kind of side channel attacks. However, as it turns out, the answer to this is a resounding no. And in the second part of this talk, um, I will show why. Because there is a different class of attacks possible uh, that does not suffer from these kind of limitations of the known spectral attacks and then can effectively leak data from such systems. So let's have a look at this new kind of spectral attack. The key idea here is not to perform a single point in time measurement of a microarchitecture state, but perform a continuous measurement of the microarchitecture state evolution. And the key idea here is to execute all of this in a loop such that we can scale up this loop and produce a stronger signal simply by um, having more loop iterations. We also utilize the cache to make the measurement, but we use a different property of the cache, namely the, the associativity of the cache. The idea here is as follows. If we assume a four-way set associative cache and we perform five memory accesses inside this loop, then we can observe two different kinds of behaviors. The first behavior occurs if those memory locations are non-conflicting, basically of different colors. Then all of those memory locations can live together in the cache. And after very first loop iterations, uh, the memory uh, locations will be held in cache and the access to each of those memory locations is very fast. During all subsequent loop iterations, the cache will be basically in steady state. It will not be changing over time because it can hold all of those five elements together. There is, however, a very distinctive behavior if we perform five memory accesses to a memory cell of the same cache color because now those five cannot live in the cache together. And what then happens is basically a cascade of cache evictions, because the cache can only hold four items of the same kind. So an access to the next item might sp uh, need to spill out one other item from the cache. In the worst case, we could have a cascade of cache uh, misses such that every individual access is actually a, a miss. Reality is a little bit more complicated than that, but at a conceptual level, this is what will happen. The trick now to perform a measurement is to pick four memory accesses to a well-known location, all of the same color, and pick a fifth memory access depending on the secret value that you want to leak. Turns out for the fifth access, we can again use speculation. It has the same effect on the cache and will perform eviction just like a real memory access will. So we utilize the same idea here to uh, trigger speculative execution dependent on the value of the secret to swap between two different cache lines and therefore learn something about the secret here. This is particularly amenable to uh, the WebAssembly execution model because uh, there we can perform speculated access without any kind of context switch and we can embed this into a loop that is generally running uh, with very little overhead and uh, we get a pretty useful signal out of this.
Important property about this new kind of spectral class attack is that it does not require any kind of separable measurement, but we measure the whole execution and we can scale it up by simply performing more loop iterations. In principle, we can target many parts of the cache hierarchy. Targeting L1 cache does not yield a really measurable signal. It turns out that uh, targeting a level two cache is sufficient to produce a measurable signal already. With level three cache, it would in principle produce a uh, far stronger signal. However, for various reasons, it's a little bit more difficult to set up this attack and it was not really researched. The other important property is that actually no kind of special instructions are required. All code gadgets can be produced using WebAssembly. If we want to practically use this attack for leaking secrets from the target system, we would perform two measurements to extract a single bit. The first measurement, we would structure the execution such that the loop executes slow if the bit that we want to measure is zero. And on the second, we would structure it such that the loop executes slow if the bit is one. So performing two measurements, we'll have uh, the possible results fast slow or slow fast. And this allows distinguishing between the zero and one states of the bit. There is actually a third kind of measurement outcome possible, namely that the executions are indistinguishable. And this is an indication that the address that we are targeting is not mapped. This is interesting in itself because it allows learning something about the address space layout of the target. In summary, we can leak one bit of secret information per each two measurements. A demonstrator on a target system, in this case an AMD Ryzen class CPU, yields that we actually achieve a slowdown by a factor of two between the slow and fast measurements. So we can execute the loop such that it takes 200 milliseconds in the one case or 100 milliseconds in the other case. And this is a very measurable signal even across the network. It can be amplified more even to the seconds range. So let's recap what are the conditions for such an attack to succeed. First, all the code gadgets need to be producible from WebAssembly code. This is a given. The second, we need to be able to make multiple measurements and crucially using the same memory layout. This is also a given in many cases and is helped by the fact that all critical accesses during this attack are read accesses. So there is, no, since there is no write, there is no page unsharing or other things happening and this helps with keeping the memory layout stable. The third condition is that we are able to trigger some speculated execution to memory of the host process uh, from the WebAssembly. This is covered in lots of research, uh, goes by the name of pointer crafting. Um, in this example, um, basically some manipulation of the branch target buffer and indirect calls was used and turned out to be sufficient. The last condition is that the attacker knows n plus one memory locations of suitable cache color. This actually turns out to be not 100% trivial and will be covered now in a kind of preparatory attack. The reason that this is not a given is that we will be targeting level two cache. However, we are working only in the virtual address space, but there is no trivial mapping or known mapping from the virtual address space to actual physical addresses, which is what the level two cache operates with. Particular equidistantly spaced memory locations in virtual address space do not necessarily map to equidistantly spaced addresses in physical address space. So what we need is to establish some kind of reverse mapping in order to choose suitable memory locations to conduct the attack. So what we need here is basically n plus one pages of the same color, which then also maps to suitable cache colors. And we can do this using an approach that is actually a bit similar uh, to the main attack. Using a very simple-minded algorithm, we'll execute a loop and perform memory accesses in, uh, in each loop iteration. And we will gradually add addresses uh, to the candidate set of addresses that we are touching in each loop iteration. We we'll perform this until we observe something distinctive uh, that happens when we add another address. So for example, in the case of a four-way set associative cache uh, in turn, what can happen is that we have a number of uh, addresses in our candidate set right now. And when we add another address, it is possible that this address is still not in conflict with any of the addresses that are already in cache. 
What we'll observe here in the measurement, performing this in a loop, is that we see a small but fairly linear performance degradation since we are just adding one more memory access to the loop. But overall, the cache still stays in steady state and the reduction performance from adding this single um, entry to the candidate set is not very large. However, very different things will happen if we suddenly add an address that is in conflict with some of the addresses already existing in the candidate set. Now, this cache cannot remain in steady state because we will have five accesses to conflicting memory locations of the same color on a four-way set associative cache, for example. And this manifests in a much larger performance degradation. And this is something that can also be measured and observed externally. Recall that the attacker still controls the number of loop iterations and can also make the signal stronger arbitrarily. A bit of modeling and also experimentation reveals that on a typical system with a four, eight way set associative cache and uh, 512 kilobytes of uh, cache. This equates to 64 page colors and turns out we just need an average um, a couple hundred queries to find the first nine color conflict. After we have established that, the strategy is then to reduce the candidate set again to ideally just nine memory locations. It turns out we don't need to be as strict. We'll still get a useful signal if we have a bit of chaff pages in there. So in summary, this preparatory attack requires a couple thousand queries, but it is very well possible to identify a suitable working set for the main attack to be conducted using these memory pages. To summarize what we have seen so far, there is a different kind of spectra attack possible, utilizing again the cache, but in a slightly different fashion than the well-known spectra attacks. This attack is feasible in scenarios where there is no intrinsic clock available on the target, and this attack can arbitrarily amplify the measured signal such that a measurement of the signal across the internet is actually possible. This means that projects using WebAssembly and allow foreign code to be executed on target might be at risk, even if they deny access to a clock altogether. This is actually a scenario that for sure applies to the internet computer, and it is extremely hard to prevent the method of attack altogether. This means that we are taking appropriate system design measures in the internet computer to protect both the internet computer itself as well as all user data held in the internet computer from this kind of attack. Thank you for your interest in this talk. 